From death to birth, the war is all the citizens of distance know. As children, it is drilled into their heads that war is the purpose behind all existence. Winter doesn't agree. She stumbles across remains of what life was like before the war began, and now she longs to be as free as her ancestors. With the help of her best friend Cedar and the boy she is forbidden to love, Tallow, she believes she can do it. Winter can see life beyond the pickets, beyond the constant hunger and the threat of death, beyond the war machine. Can one teenage girl and her dream of a better life really change the whole world? Find out in Distance Book One, Winter's Rising. This is the Chronicles of Michael Talbot, the podcast. No, so I'm very happy that I don't do that no more. And I always tip uh-huh. my, my delivery driver well because I know he has to deal with it. Always, so. always. So we are on distance. Yes. So you sounded excited and you were the only one that answered the call, which I am not complaining about. Um, everybody, I love the people, and this is for everybody out there. You all say you love the stories and you enjoy the podcast, but nobody wants to come on. It's not a huge deal. You don't need a lot of equipment. You don't. don't. All you need is knowledge and a love for these stories and just Uh nothing else to talk to you about with them. That makes no one else to talk to with them, about them. Yeah. So, yeah. And also my big thing is that like, um, my wife did listen to the series too, but I love that. I love getting a completely different perspective on the books and then talking a little bit deeper about things that like I have may have, um, cause I listen to the books while I'm driving most of the time. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's nice to like somebody else has caught something that puts another thread together. So I love talking about them cause it's just a, it's just a whole different perspective and I love it. Yeah. This is only my second uh, listen through on this whole series and I've uh-huh. only gotten through book one. I did it twice. So it's kind of, I know what's coming up in the next two kind of, but I don't know how this series ends. I know uh-huh. cameo appearance that comes up in book two, but I don't know how it leads. Like I forget how they got to that point. So, which okay. is kind of good for me because when we, with these past weeks, we've been doing all this, it's, we already know what's coming up. So it's hard mm-hmm. to talk about something in a, as a fresh perspective, knowing well, what's going to happen. And then you give away spoilers and then you know what else is going to happen. So this is kind of different for me because this is still fresh in my mind. I forget what happens next. Mm, I got the mind of a goldfish. So <laughs> this will be good. <laughs> but if you do going from that, mm-hmm. um, let's start off with, I like this this series. I like this book. I didn't think I was going to like it. And when I first mm-hmm. read it, I messaged Mark and I was like, dude, is this a kissing book? What did you write? Because I went from <laughs> zombie fallout to Indian Hill to distance. I did I skipped a lot of the other ones. I didn't get to the other ones yet because I went, oh, this looks this looks different. This chick looks like a badass on the cover. And you know, it's got winter with the sword and like oh, this would be like a fantasy Lord of the yeah. Rings type of thing. And <laughs> When you start on it, you don't know what it is. It's totally different. There's no zombie. Uh-huh. There's no aliens. You're just in a post-utopia world. And you don't realize what it is until, uh, uh, what's his name? I had every, I got everybody's name written down so I don't, so I don't forget everybody. Uh, Brody says, I trained at Indian Hill. And you go, oh, shit. Is this another one of Mark's like uh-huh. things? Or is this a continuation after the events of Indian Hill, because it takes place in the future, way ass in the future. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So that got me, kept me listening to it. And then I fell in love with that. I was like, oh, I get it now. This book's awesome. This chick's a badass. Her friend's a badass. Tallow's uh-huh. a little whiny bitch. Uh, you know, and, and they'll get through it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like that Tallow holds his own, but I was like, you you got a man up, Tal. Come on now, like you. <laughs> you he, still, he he plays through the whole thing that I'm going to be the man. I'm going to be the tough guy. I'm going to be chivalrous, and he just he kind of gets his ass handed to him every time. Consistently, so consistently. It's funny. This is a sister's book, you know. Girl mm-hmm. power, winter all day, and 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 uh, cedar. They dominate this story. The entire thing. And I think for me, like, again, when I first started reading it, I think the um, the only reason I read it was because I saw that there was another, it was another series um, 
Mark had wrote it and I was like, okay, three more books. Like, this is great. And I, I honestly didn't have anything else to read or mm-hmm. reread. I was still waiting for ZF20. So I was like, eh, I already read, you know, like in Indian Hill, how many times? Let me just try, I might as well try this. And it really, um, I don't think I really, I think I started getting interested in it because um, of how Mark started describing the world. And I was like, oh, this is, this is a different perspective, especially like the, the very first mini story that they talk about like because you kind of want to know <clears throat> what killed that soldier and like what is their life like like he literally says like you can't there's i was bred for this i couldn't you know i was bred for war and then he starts a battle but then you're like well what is he battling i've read other mark books of the zombies is it monster or what is he battling so i think it kind of like really grasped me there because i wanted to know what the fight was all about you know mm-hmm. <clears throat> And it makes you wonder, who are the brokers? Are the brokers in Shrouded World or the overseers? That's what I'm thinking, the overseers, not the brokers. Have you read Shrouded World yet? I'm not going to lie. I, it's very, uh, I did not get through Shrouded World. It's, it's a tough it's, read. It's, it's a tough read. I know. I, I, I agree. <laughs> I, I crossed my fingers. I promise, I promise I'm going to get through it. But I think I only got like, when Mike and Trip got... Uh, split with a uh, jack guy at like a building that's where mm-hmm. i got i i just stopped after that gotcha because there are overseer overseer type of characters in shrouded world that kind of they're the puppet masters that uh, run everything so i but i i, I read it I listened to it so long ago i can't remember if that's what it was but in uh-huh. this story the overseers run everything and you find out later in the story that the overseers oversee kind of the entire i don't know if it's the entire state of colorado because that's really all they're fighting in right now or is it that they're overseers in every state that they all just control the battles and keep everybody fighting with each other and you got to wonder to yourself well why is everybody fighting with each other they're not fighting for land they're not fighting for uh uh what's it called um, position or stance uh-huh. or, or anything like that. Uh-huh. Why are they having them all fight each other? What's the point? It's, it's giving progerians to me. Like <laughs> I don't like that's the only. I really I think that was one of the, it was one of the few questions that got kind of lost in the sauce as we were trying to figure it out. Like what like out of all the answers that we got throughout the series, that was probably one of them that it was just like, but why? Right. Is what is liter- what is the literal point of it? You know what I mean. Mm-hmm. You get a lot of other post utopian type of stories. You know, you, like, you get uh, what's the one with the with the chick, the 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 arrow chick, the Hunger Games. Uh, Hunger Games. Yeah. They all fight for each you each uh, each district is fighting for mm-hmm. for their other district. In distant distance is just a uh, say a district or a, a town or whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. They're going up against the the Ferals and the Hillians and the Klondikes and the Brutons, but they're just fighting. And it's for no turning, reason. The, other than your reason. Different... I still haven't gotten to a, a, a point of, of it. And it's making me wonder, well, well, why? What's what's gonna happen? What's the mm-hmm. big what's the reason? Is it is it glory? Is it bragging rights? Why? Like I said, giving progerian to me because I don't feel like there's any, there's literally, it doesn't seem like there's a reason because it doesn't necessarily mean control or anything because the people could just live out their lives in this state and just call it a day. Mm-hmm. But you're, again, there's really, you really can't put your finger on a viable reason on why they're, they have this type of discrimination throughout the state. Mm-hmm. Do, do we find that is it? It's kind of a, a lot of Mark's stories kind of have an undertone theme of, of his life, of his experience, of his mm-hmm. background in the military. And, you know, he loves Colorado and he loves Maine. Those seem to be his two, his two main areas. Do we see a, a post Indian Hill future like this? Because Indian Hill ended with another ship coming in and president mm-hmm. Mike calls the other Mike. So there's a couple of different worlds and, this takes place when they find the library. Excuse me. Cedar says that the farthest book that they go back is 2047. That's the farthest. That's the, the latest record that they have. So mm-hmm. I'm guessing this is 2048. The world goes to hell. Everything kind of. So what what happens to the world that 
it goes like this. And is it the whole world? Is it just America? What? I think for that, and I guess I don't want to jump too too ahead, but I think the happening happens. Mm-hmm. I think that that's literally what happened. Like the the people got too smart for themselves. And again, regular humans are trying to protect the world, but now they have superhumans in a sense, and they still have a progerian threat and they still have a striver threat, you know, possibly. So there's so much still going on. And now it's like, now it's like, what, what are we going to do now? Now we're literally in a completely different war that we actually started to uh, create ourselves because we allowed people to do what happens in the happening. Mm-hmm. And now that like, they think they're better. So now we have a completely different branch of humans that are um, thinking that they're better than us. And now they're trying to take over. So they it's don't like really have another... superpowers of kind of how to, how to, how, to yeah. how mad Jack it shot himself with the striver venom and he kind of mm-hmm. gave himself super brain, super intelligence. Nobody in this story really has that. Or is that what mm-hmm. the overseers are? Are they the ones with the super intelligence and are they picking the pieces apart going, you know, dance monkey, you're going to fight for us and for our enjoyment. I think the only reason that I wouldn't agree with that is because of the uh, striver hybrids that Cedar and uh, 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 Winter end up finding that Mm -hmm. are already changing. So it would be interesting that there are people that um, are hybrids that are down on in Colorado that are running everything that haven't changed yet. Or maybe they're just a different strand. I don't know. Could be. Who, who, who knows? But you got to wonder <laughs> what happened to the world where an entire library gets buried in the dirt. Or was that intentional? Because the, 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 the book opens up, Winter's walking there. She's out hunting and her foot gets stuck in the mud, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. up and to her knee. And Tallow comes along and pulls her up and she sees the glass of the, what's I'm assuming is the, the roof of yeah. the library because unless the building is on its side and it's a window, they find a, a totally buried library. Now, most libraries are two or three stories high. Mm-hmm. What happened to the world where there was that much dirt and debris that would raise up that much to bury an entire building like that? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a big thing too. Cause it's like, um, it's interesting that it's specific because there's other buildings that are still erect. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's not like all the buildings have fell over. So it's interesting what happened in that area that it was grown over so much that like it, it was a, a chance that they found that, you know? Do we think it was intentional that the overseers maybe had it buried or buried it intentionally? So the Distanians, Distancians, whatever you want to call it, the free people yeah. or the not so free uh-huh. people didn't find the, the the library to to discover their past. But if that's the case, why not just destroy it and burn it all because it's it's all paper? Maybe they thought they did just bomb that area that was close to a library and be like, oh, it's not there anymore. We're good to go. It's covered in rubble. We're good yeah. to go. Because, I mean, look at Cedar. She started reading and her mind is expanded crazy, but she asked, like, everybody knows that you keep just like a, like a snake or a fish, if you keep them in a small container, that's all they grow. That's all they can grow. That's all they know. Mm -hmm. So once you literally take away their, their, once you literally take away their um, access to knowledge, they only know what you tell them. You know what I mean? And it it gives them, it's a, it's a ridiculous level of control. Yeah. But Cedar's knowledge is all romance novels. In the first book, but, from the, but yeah, but from from those, she ends up getting like she has. But even I think even in that romance novels, she has different perspectives. Like mm-hmm. I know she's obsessed with kilts and stuff in the first one, but she ends up having so many. She ends up having so many different um perspectives on life, and I think just because they mention things that don't like you may think doesn't have relevance, but relevance. But like when she remembered the reference to Christmas lights, that literally save them at one point just because she remembered like a small reference of Christmas lights and what's the possibility of an outcome. You know, mm-hmm. you can't think of that if you've never seen them before. Good point. Good point. And I, I like how they bring every, not bring everybody in, but the whole thing with Brody where Brody's kind of, he's a, a, a broker and the brokers are. So the whole book is kind of broken down into Let's say it's it's like classes. You know, you got the upper class, mm-hmm. which are the overseers. overseers. You got 
the 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 jail wardens, so to speak, or the prison guards, which are the brokers, and then you got mm-hmm. the citizens, which are the basically the prisoners because they can't leave because of the picket fences and the the electrical wiring and things. Those are the dis distance. I want to say disdainians, but dis <laughs> disdancians. <laughs> That's confusing to say. The <laughs> citizens of distance, and until they're eighteen, they don't know anything else. They're not taught how to fight. They're not taught that there's is anything else outside of this area besides the people you go to fight with. But mm-hmm. Brody knows in his mind somehow, some way, because he's 25 and that's ancient by distancian terms uh, yeah. and age. Cause most of them go to war at 18 and they die. They never come back. Mm-hmm. There's gotta be more out there. There's gotta be more to this, this area because there'll be more to this world and yeah. what is going on. And, See, uh, about winter is smart enough to recognize that. And she tells Brody, listen, here's the deal. I'll make a deal with you. Come with us. We'll show you this amazing area with all of these pamphlets or leaflets, whatever they call them. Uh, and you read this history of the world book one and see if you, what you think. And mm-hmm. after that, Brody's mind is blown. He's like, all right, here's the deal. We're going to train. We're going to fight. You're going to live. We're going to go through all of this, which is and the power of books and knowledge, it, which it, they don't have. It is. Yeah. Which is crazy to me because I think even, I, I think the best thing about it is that the fact that everybody like humans are naturally curious. So I think the fact that Brody was even willing to think for a second, like they might have a legitimate reason on why they did all that they've done so far. And I'm going to look, let me just see what's going on here. And the mm-hmm. fact that, again, he retained so much knowledge. He retained everything that he was reading. And it's just like, you know what? Shit's about to change. I don't know how it's about to change, but you're a part of it, clearly. And we're going to make sure that you guys actually have the best foot forward that I can give you. Like, I think that entire thought process to me is like bananas, knowing how they grew up and they were raised. You know, mm-hmm. they were basically trained monkeys. And then, then they gave him a book and it's like, oh crap, there's more out here than just war. So is it the whole concept of if you give a monkey a typewriter, he will eventually learn how to type the great novel? If you give a yeah. distancian books, will they soon become great warriors or expand their mind outside of what is in their general area? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, and then you got to think about it too, for out of all the other tribes that are out there, why are the Distancians the only ones that are like literally forced into all of this and not like raised and led and learn how to fight and things like that? Like the Hillians, the Hillians and the, uh, uh, um, the Hillians, like they were trained from birth. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? They were trained from birth to fight. Like they know that that's their mission. And that's a hell of a lot different than somebody who's just, they're told they're bred. You, you, we give you enough to survive. And then at 18, you sh- we ship you off to, to go, you know, but every other tribe out there, none of them were as confined as the distance, as the people from distance, which I thought was very interesting as well. I looked at it as it's kind of their version of population control. Of, mm-hmm. of letting you know you you, know, you, you purge a, a forest when it becomes too wild you burn some of it down to stop the growth stop the wild growth i think in my mind that that's what they're doing with some of the citizens it's okay you guys are set up to breed you're the breeders you're the fighters you're the warriors you got the ferals which are kind of trained but they're wild humans mm-hmm. like what, what is everybody Yeah. Yeah. It's like everybody, I think Cedar, I think Cedar broke it down really nicely when she said that there is kind of like a prison, how everybody is separated from like whites, Mexicans, blacks, like everybody's separated into their own ness and they're, and they live like that and they're they're dedicated and committed to their own quote unquote tribe. Mm -hmm. Can't we all just get along? Isn't that what winter is trying to do? (laughs) Facts. That is exactly what she's trying to do. And she tries it. And I don't want to give away too much at the end, because if you haven't read this story, you really should. Don't judge a book by its cover. It's definitely not a chick book. Yes. I'll be the yeah, first one definitely not. because definitely I thought not. it was. Um, she gets double crossed. She tries to form an alliance. She tries to get, we're all going to fight 
together and you know you got the deno factor of everything it's i'm going to do yep. what i can to protect my ass and save mm -hmm. me and screw you and everybody else that i have to step on yep 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 absolutely and i and i think that's like for like for her journey like even if you want to skip a little bit ahead like once they ended up uh how much did you love the fact that uh winter has that skill of like what did, what does she call it her her honing in skill like the time displacement type of thing yeah. where she could yeah yeah like how fucking awesome is that like Your spider the fact that, yeah like it to me i think it's like it's so limitless because she she evolves it throughout the throughout the books and which is to me it's like brody's like yeah you have you have a couple seconds which is which is which blew my mind because i was like once you learn further that um uh certain people end up having certain skills depending on who their lineage is mm -hmm. um makes me wonder where what lineage brody is because mm -hmm. how does he have the time dilation the same as winter do you think they're related? Because you, you never know. They don't know who's you don't, they don't know you don't. And sister. That, Only Winter knows who her mother is because her mother found her and said, I'm your mother. And I'm your, like, yeah. Okay, yeah. you're my mother. Yeah, which I think blew my mind because I'm like, if if certain people of the I think I think they were specific and said that the Talbot lineage, after a certain time, they ended up having um certain powers mm -hmm. or certain abilities that were different than other people. So it, it comes to it comes to reason like Brody might be like a distant I guess not distant because they're the same age, but there could be some some Talbot blood flowing through him, which I think is even more um which I think even puts it a little bit more into perspective how random and lucky that uh winter is throughout this entire process because if it would have been any other broker who happened to be chosen to be leader like she could have just been dead the first couple chapters of the book she's lucky it wasn't durgan seriously even Durgan's... though he was even though they said he was a good guy when they honestly i got more hooked into the book when they when they when they said uh she had killed Durgan. I was like, oh, fuck. They, they put Durgan in here again? Nice. <laughs> like, just recycling names over here. Yeah, it's, 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 it's all the, 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 the tryptiverse, you know, mm -hmm. all those names in there. Um, well, uh, what, what, once I realized that the book is kind of a continuation of a post of the, after the events of Indian Hill, mm -hmm. is Winter and Brody and the people with the kind of the special abilities, are they the people that kind of like mad jack where they injected themselves they had the striver dna and over time it mutated through the lineage and through you know whatever they had going on is mm -hmm. that does that uh uh not a side effect but is that a, a reason for it all I think that was my either. that was my thinking once on my second read through i was like oh wait this is kind of this and once I listened to Indian Hill again, I was like, oh shit, that's right. He had uh, the striver blood. He became super intelligent. But whereas it's a post-apocalyptic thing and the world kind of ended, did it diminish? And now it's starting to come through. Kind of like with, you know, the X-Men and the mutants where it 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 comes out, you know, during puberty and when your sentin sentin senses are heightened and you're at your most, you know, amped up. Yeah, yeah. I think that's one of those things where you're, you're, it's again, you won't know, but I think that it may have a, a sliver of that, like mm -hmm. a sliver, like a, like a bit of truth in that, because even, um, I think even when this, when this, when, uh, the, um, the, the, the striver, uh, hybrid people injected tallow, um, it ended up, she, they said like a very small percentage of the human race is, um, is, a uh, immune to it and they could use that to continue to breed their like regular people and calm down the mutation who knows maybe cedar and winter would be that part of the population that are is immune to it because they already have some type of like mutated change to it but they were actually able to make it work you know what i mean they weren't able to because you know you find out later in the book that um no one's been to earth like which is which that in itself blows my mind Mm -hmm. That everybody just kind of like this, like didn't care about Earth anymore, and now they're like, because of everything that's happening, now everybody's trying to come back. 
I and I think that in itself blows my mind as well. Right. It is. Was Mark thinking of all this when he wrote it, or was he was like like Mark always does? He writes himself into a corner, and we find <laughs> out in book two at the beginning uh-huh. of it that he wrote himself into a corner and had to write himself out and went. Is this where we're meant to do, or yeah, just go mm-hmm. in this direction? And let's just see what happens. You know, let's throw enough yeah. shit against the wall, see what sticks, and go. All right, we're going in this direction now. Let's take a left and see what happens. Yeah, I think As he was Mark definitely does. able to go to a lot. Yeah, I think he was definitely able to go to a lot of different directions when it came to this. Uh, when it came to this series, because I think there were so many different amazing points that were mm-hmm. able to be pointed out. And um, God, I tell you what, you just never knew what the hell was going to happen throughout that entire book. <laughs> you just had to keep going <laughs> to figure out what Mark wanted to do with it. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think that kind of came into effect with, with him and John when they were doing Shrouded World. You're like, did they write this together? Were they Zooming each other? Or did one person just write one thing? The other one wrote the other and they said, okay, let's take a little bit of this and that. Let's let's make mm-hmm. this work. And, you know, when we get to the Shrouded World part, portion of the podcast, it, it's, it's going to be an interesting episode because yeah, those are some messed up stories that... Mm-hmm. Take you, take you for a ride, definitely. But definitely, definitely, yeah. So, what didn't you like about this, this particular book? Not the series, because we're just doing book one right now. Winter's Rising. What, what, what were you hoping was going to happen that didn't happen? You were like, eh, not a huge fan of that. I know for me, mm. um, it, you can go ahead. My wife is tiptoeing. I'm like, you can't hear anything. You couldn't just hear the huge <laughs> thunderclap that went outside. You're not going to hear her tiptoeing by. Did um, not hear that. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it, it'll go thunder. No, it's going to leave it open. It'll go rain, and then it's sunny two seconds later. And then it'll pour in thunder, and then it's sunny two seconds later. It's just That's it's crazy literally what's going right on here. right now. That's yeah. literally what's going on right now. So it's the same thing. You're in Phila- Philadelphia, Pennsylvania? No, uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Okay, Pen- I knew it was Pennsylvania. I couldn't remember which part of Pennsylvania. So we're all, we're all East Coast. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I I, I want to say, I, I don't I hate, to, I hate to say I, I did like something about the story, but you got to find the good, the bad, and the ugly in everything, mm-hmm, in every mm-hmm. story that you read. I, I think the part I didn't like was the whole, the whole tallow, and winter story i don't think it needed a love story kind of thrown into it my mm-hmm. opinion but tallow and winter are kind of the mike and tracy of this series agreed agreed i i, I think i gotta agree with you on that too i i don't think um teenage romance novels is mike's forte so um yeah i just didn't i think that was the only thing because i think i was super i think with everything that winter and cedar were trying to do when, especially when they joined up with the Hillians and they were dealing with uh, the fat guy and everything, like they were going, like I, at 35, I couldn't imagine dealing with somebody who was that annoying as Tala was in that situation. And I think I would have just like, I, it's, it's, it, I think it was just way too much drama for the situation that was at hand. Like mm-hmm. we are literally in the middle of a, like a war and agreement. There's a lot of crap going on right now. And you want to be jealous because I'm attracted to another man. Like what the fudge? I've never like, seen another a, man before, you know, <laughs> facts like and this, and apparently, and apparently this guy is sculpted from Marvel. So right. I mean, how can I not be attracted? Like, I, I I think that was probably the only thing that they're, they're a little bickering back and forth. I love the fact that Cedar kept inter- interjecting like all the time, like just keeping Winter on task because I feel like Winter would have, uh, it would have been more difficult if she didn't have the rock of a person that Cedar is. Well, I think Cedar got her experience too from the romance novels that she mm-hmm, was reading, mm-hmm. you know, the Fabio long flowing hair yep, type of yep, romance yep. novels that she had. <laughs> That's where she learned how to date, you know? Yep. And it, uh, she ends up falling for, uh, for Sarah. Yep. You yep. Know, through the whole thing. And you find out what that kind of whole it, it, thing is going to go. Yeah. Which I thought was, uh, I think, but I, I think, I think Cedar plays her. I think Cedar is, uh, 
Winter's BT because she needs she really needs that that strong minded uh, individual who can kick ass and also like be the voice of reasoning for her when she's mm -hmm. going through or just just honestly nonsense. Like I I I think that was probably the the one part that just really irked me. It's just like yo, either confess your undying love for Winter and call it a day, mm -hmm. or, or just step aside, bro. <laughs> like, yeah. So holy crap. Thank God my basement doesn't flood because we would be screwed this week. That that would suck. That it's would literally suck. just like opened up right now again. So I'm, I'm right. I'm in the the dining room right by the right by the door. So I don't know if you can hear that. Yeah, I can't hear anything. Oh, that's okay, good. good, it, that's good it's audio. raining. It's just a big clap of thunder just came through. So <laughs> that's good audio. <laughs> so, but um, so getting toward the end of the story, uh. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Brody teaches them how to fight. Mm -hmm. That's where we learn how Winter has the kind of the time delay or time lapse or yep, whatever she yep. wants to call it. And they end up calling her the ghost because she's such a fierce. When they get to the battles at the end of the book, uh, chapter, you know, that the third act of the book, she's kicking ass and she owes that all to, to Brody that mm -hmm. took a chance on them and said, maybe these guys have something going on that they're they're not bullshitting me about i'm gonna uh -huh. train them i'm gonna follow them i'm gonna listen to them and she gets the reputation and is called the ghost because she's so fast and she's moving but hayden also has that same ability and catches her off guard so it's the whole who is everybody how is everybody connected in this old little world here Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which i think um i think there's a lot of uh pluses on winter's side because even though hayden has the same ability as she does the same way as brody has the same ability as she does um depending on i think it, i think it all falls down to what you're fighting for mm -hmm. like hayden had nothing but uh uh, uh anger and rage and just like, I need to prove myself male bravado that he was bringing to the fight, even though he's been literally training for how many years before he, you know, Winter's only been training for a year. Right. And the fact that she can um, take that level of like precision and be like, you know what, I got this and fight in a different way. I think is again, her, one of her benefits that she has, like, yes, she can come off emotional when she first starts fighting, but when she actually hones in on what she's fighting for, whether it be her life or another individual, that's what really like hones in her skill to a, to a deadly accuracy that it, yeah. that it is. I, I kind of uh, um, related to the karate kid where you get, uh, you know, Johnny is Hayden and he's been training his whole life and everything like that. And then in comes winter, who's only been training a year and she's going toe to toe with him, you know, right at the uh -huh. end. And uh -huh. Brody's kind of like the Mr. Miyagi of like, Nope, you're going to hold this sword up for an hour and this is how it's going to be. And you're going to do this stupid little chore and this is going to relate to this. And it's, it was kind of funny that, 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 that that's, that's, I don't think that's how, what Mark, you know, was watching the karate kid yeah. wrote this, but it, it kind of similar comes back to that where you can relate it. You can kind of relate everything to everything in, in, in some part of a, mm -hmm. of, of a Agreed. story. So Agreed. that that's kind of what I, what I related it to. And I like that because I like the karate kid. That was, it was, it was a classic, clear yeah. classic. So, yeah. Um, so we're going to end there with book one. They're kind of, there's not a lot of information in these stories. A lot of it is kind of re not repetitiveness, but this static scenes. It's a kind of a, it's a quick read. There's not a lot bunched into it. Book two yeah. gets a little more in depth and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the intro of book two next week, because I have the actual, somebody sent me an actual copy of the original version of. Oh, nice. And how. Um, I mean, in, in the original story, Tallow dies at the end. Yeah. And at the beginning of book two, Mark's like, okay, here's the deal. Here's what happened. I made myself in a corner. <laughs> I screwed up. I'm going to bring this guy back. And they yeah. went as far as to like Seinfeld this, where they went back and he rewrote the last pages. They went and got somebody else. They got Sean to do the story because some other woman did the story, did the mm -hmm. audio book. They re-edited it, like redid the entire thing to keep up with the chrono with, with with the way he it, it, to make it sound consistent. Because I think a lot of us would have been a little taken back to hear 
a, a Mark book without Sean. I would agree. I, th- I think I probably wouldn't have uh, listened to it if it, uh, it would have been weird if I would have mm-hmm. if I would have listened to it and it wasn't Sean on it. So I agree with that. And I'm not a huge fan of listening to stories of a, a female point of view, like a like a female kind of story without a female voice. But with Sean, but with Sean, it works. I feel like he's very androgynous. Mm-hmm. Never met him, but I feel like he is. <laughs> well, I'm hoping to get him on the show someday. So maybe if he'll ever answer my emails and he's not busy. We can we can find out a little bit more of how he gets in depth and how he gets into character and that, blo- that would blow my fucking mind. That yeah. blow my fucking mind. Yeah. <laughs> it would be great. So. It would. It would. So the end of book one, they actually um end up they're about to battle the uh the uh fat man's guys. No, wait, hold on. Are they the brute? They're the brutons. No, they're right? not, no, they're, no, they're not battling. No, brutons. No, it's not the brutons. Uh, she doesn't run into the Brutons until she tries to go back to the pickets. Oh, that's right. Um, that's right. Yeah, I forget the uh, fat guys. Whoever they are. So, this, no. Oh, God, it's going to get up on her. But um, so she finds out that she has to go. She's with the um, Comanche Keys, mm-hmm. with the Hillians, and they are about to fight the Fat Man's squad. But their um, Cedar and Winter are feeling like something is not right. And about this entire setup, even though she kind of trusts Hayden, but is still feeling like a little some type of way because of how Hayden kind of like completely 180 their the way he communicates to her and stuff. And she's like, mm, something's yeah. not right. So they find that secret passageway in their um, side of the mountain and find a way to actually get out. So yep. Cedar is tasked with getting all of the Distantians out while Winter... And Tallow, they finally fucking make up. Jesus Christ. Uh, they head out to the war. They head out to the battle. And then they, they actually are starting the fight. But that bunker was Paul's old bunker in Colorado. That they built out in Colorado before they left and went to Indian Hill. Did you pick that up? So originally in Indian Hill, when Paul was out there, Paul was originally in Colorado building the Colorado militia. That yeah. bunker... That this is how I took it. That bunker was Paul's bunker that he built before they left and went to Indian Hill out in Colorado. Because it had the gun machine guns, Hill. it had the tanks, it had all the weapons, it had everything already in there. Oh, did he rename the second place that they had built Indian Hill to as well? The, se- the original the second place out in Walpole was always Indian Hill. Yes. Because Indian Hill was originally a, a, a wooded area that Mark and his friends mountaintop. used to play at as kids. That's what Indian yep. Hill was. The yeah. Colorado Bunker, I don't know if it ever had a name. I think it was just called the Colorado Bunker. I did not pick up on that. I did not. Because I, I thought, I figured it had something to do with some type of bunker. But I was like, I don't know. I don't. I didn't think it was ever clear um, what bunker it was and mm-hmm. now my quite not because i i thought it did have something to do with some type of militia like i figured it was some type of um indian hill uh bunker area but it always kind of blew my mind again it blows your mind that there's 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 literally a a, a, a pathway mm-hmm. that has a ridiculous amount of arms that if <laughs> anybody else would have found it yeah yeah, could have completely that um, devastated the devastated the area that they were in. But then I just thought about this now too: is that Tal- uh, Tallow Brody says that he trained at Indian Hill. He did. Now, if the Distancians in Winter only knows about this area, is Indian Hill the original Indian Hill in Walpole, Mass, which is a couple hundred, maybe thousand miles away from each other? I don't know how far Colorado mm-hmm. to Walpole is to Massachusetts is. Yeah. Or was there another Indian hill out in this area? Oh, in it's possi- Colorado. It's, it's, I, I don't know. It's possible because or is it you just tying you, everything together in a yeah, it's, it's sort of possible way? because you, you already know in Indian Hill, once uh, once Mike came back, Paul had multiple uh uh what would you call them? Uh, militia stations all yep. over the world. So it wouldn't be surprising that he you know, had a had multiple places like this, mm-hmm. but it blows. But then, it, it, but then again, it blows your mind because it's like, why had why is Winter and Cedar the ones that stumble upon this? Right. If anybody else would have stumbled stumbled upon this, 
the entire book would have been completely different. And yeah. all it's and but but they exit through a place. So it's like it's not like it's impossible to find. But again, it's like one of those things that blow your mind. It's, it takes one curiosity ridden girl and they find a way to help them get another edge throughout the book that actually like makes it so that they have another advantage that they didn't have originally. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Amazing. And that's where we will end it. And we will mm -hmm. pick it up next week. Are you available next week? Are we continuing with yes. this? Yes, I am. All right. Good. So All right. we'll be back next week. If you have not read uh, the, the the Distance series, go and definitely do it because it Please is do. well worth it. It is not a mm -hmm. chick book at all. It's a chick book, but they're badass chicks. So, Oh, wait. Pause. I'm sorry. Um, isn't this, isn't the end of this book, the epilogue, where uh Mike's uh distant child meets uh hope. Yes. That was amazing. Yes. Oh my god, I must forgot about that. Yes. <laughs> um is it Mike's distant child meets oh yeah so distant so relative winter yeah. Yeah. is related to Mike mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a roundabout because... sort of way. Yes. Yeah. Oh wait and they also find that um there, there's so many good things with this book that just help you get more solid with it. I don't want to spoil anything for anybody who hasn't read it, right. but there's so many, there is a lot of heart tugging points that happen in this book and a very lovable favorite character pops up at the end of this book as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely read it. <laughs> Check it out. So Amber, yeah. thank you very much. Of course. <laughs> I'll talk to you next week. All right. See ya. All right. Bye.